Here at the BQN Network, we support and express solidarity for all of the writers and actors that have brought us the stories we passionately speak about. We continue to show love to all that are fighting the good fight for the WGA, SAG-AFTRA, and any upcoming strikes. We stand with you. You're listening to BQN. Assimilate the audio. Welcome to Cinema Z, a film discussion and review podcast on BQN. We're here to just showcase the films you probably missed, but should definitely check out. From independent and obscure to art house and absurd, each week we'll gather, perhaps cocktail in hand, to discuss it all. I'm your host, Mark White, and with me today are Matt, Laz, Mel, and Casey. we got a full house today. Hey, guys. Hey. Hi. So, uh, listeners might know Mel, Melissa, uh, she has been listening since the beginning to our podcast, <laughs> and we invited her on this week for our extra special roundtable event, and Casey is uh, joining us from Trek FM, um, where he hosts the show over there. So, welcome, Casey. Thank you. Good to be Woo-hoo. here. Let's see here. What's everybody drinking? Well, uh, today... Uh, listeners know I usually do some sort of wine cooler situation. I decided to up my game um, from Ralph's, the local Southern California grocery store, to Smart and Final. <laughs> I have a lovely Mai Tai uh, oh. from the company. It's called On the Rocks. It's in a bottle. Uh, it comes in a bottle that looks like a potion. I look like I'm about to, I don't know, make poly juice or something like that. <laughs> um, mm. But uh, it's tasty. It's 20% alcohol and 40 pr- what does 40 proof mean a lot yeah <laughs> okay a lot. this is it about to be sip a- it slowly it's not juice it is <laughs> not juice and it tastes like juice this is going to be a very fun round table this is <laughs> this is mike's extra harder <laughs> it's always good when it's extra harder <laughs> <laughs> oh my it has begun <laughs> you already I'm drinking. Oh, you go, Laz. You tell. <laughs> yeah, so I'm Laz, and I am, as usual, the designated, designated podcaster, and I am drinking my H2O just to keep all these folks in line, just in case. <laughs> Thank you, Laz. <laughs> Thank I'm you, drinking. Laz. Hi, I'm Melissa, and I'm drinking the super exciting caffeine-free diet Pepsi. So water, basically. <laughs> you, got, wow. you got my back in case the uh, the fellas get a little rowdy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, I got you last. <laughs> well, Mel, I I am drinking the caffeinated diet Pepsi. <laughs> so. <laughs> it might be good. Good. Love Thank you. We got Very a crew good. against y'all. <laughs> Mark Mark didn't say what he's drinking. Yeah, we, you... this episode is sponsored by Pepsi. I uh, <laughs> <laughs> I today wanted so bad to make a Mai Tai and I went to get all the liquors together to make the Mai Tai and realized my partner had used up the last of the white rum so that did not happen Uh, but instead I do have uh, a mango margarita uh, and this is my refill of said margarita because I've already drank half of it and I refilled it so yes Um. You guys, I might have to have a stiff drink afterwards. That all yeah, is <laughs> something <laughs> stiff, drink. Yeah. Melissa. Something stiff. Something <laughs> stiff is important. <laughs> Always well balanced diet is part of a well balanced diet. <laughs> She's listened yeah. to us before. She knows what she was getting into. <laughs> I, um, I <laughs> let's see here. All right. Well, jumping into it, we don't have a synopsis today because we're not discussing a movie, but uh, we are all here today because each of us love cinema. Now, the first question I have today is I'd like to ask everybody, when did you first realize you might be a cinephile or a film buff? Well, I was thinking of the story when I was 12. I was a book kid, library kid, always had a book in my hand. Mm -hmm. And when I got older and started taking, you know, English classes and writing classes, everybody was uh, putting that towards poetry and literature. Mm -hmm. And mine all went to movies. So 
I saw when I was 12, I saw the original Raiders of the, Indiana Jones Raiders of the mm-hmm. Lost Ark. And my best friend had just been, been put in traction at the hospital. She was in the hospital for the whole summer. And oh. that was going to be our big thing that we did. So mm-hmm. I concentrated on it really, really hard and really focused so I could tell her all about it up at the hospital. And it just made me, I just was instant in love. And then I became that girl at slumber parties who was like trying to explain the subtext and the lighting motifs to oh, wow. movies like Mr. Mom or <laughs> Crying Kid or something. So it's awesome. just been that. And ever since, I just, I watch them all the time, every that's day. beautiful. It really is. Yeah. Thank oh, you for sharing that. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Also, you were like a good friend, 12 years old. You were ready. Yeah. Mm. Well, she was my best friend. We were inseparable. So. Mm. And I remember my mom saying, because we had her little brother with us and my little brother. And I remember my mom, because they were scared, because they were nine. I was cool because I was 12. But <laughs> she kept saying, you know, on the other side of that scary snake or whatever, there's like 100 people standing there watch- watching them and helping. Mm. And so mm. it's a cre- it's not scary. It's creative. And that just stuck with me. Mm. Oh, God. When did I know about my cinephilia? <laughs> I became aware probably when I, I brought this up when I uh, on Cinema Z, I think when we did our first uh, podcast, but um, my dad did this thing with me. He still does it now where he uh, takes me to dad's film school. And Aww. so, yeah. And so that started, it started after we saw the first Matrix movie. And he basically said to me, okay, so you have seen the Matrix You've seen like the 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 kung fu, the, the the martial arts, and you've seen the art form. I want to show you where they got their ideas from. Mm. Um, and so we started watching all kinds of karate and kung fu films, and Bruce Lee and Michelle Yeoh and, and Jet Li, and like all of these all these movies from from that genre, that style. But he said you need to know where it came from. And after that, it went to we went from martial arts to comedy to to action movies to to dramas to films. You know, Spike Lee's work. And every summer, every Christmas, up until now, I'm now I'm 35 years old. But that was like that started at 12 years old. Now 35. Every time I visit my dad, here's on here's what's on the list. Here's what we're watching. You need to see this. You got got to show you this. Um. So that that's but 12 years old old is when it started for me i would say after seeing the matrix and going to dad's film school I love that. Awesome. we've said this before but your dad is like super awesome and we need to like have him on at some point mm-hmm. oh oh yeah perhaps we will so i would say i became the first time that i understood what it meant to be a true cinephile was In high school, uh, I went to an art high school and we had a film studies class. And although it was not appropriate whatsoever, a bunch of us, because we were all really into film, we ended up watching Requiem for a Dream together. Oh, I'm sorry. How old were you? 15. Oh. (laughs) And fun fact for the viewers, because I'm always the Debbie Downer. (laughs) <laughs> I came from a family where my father uh, was actually a, unfortunately, he became a, a drug addict. Oh, wow. So I remember seeing that film and how they represented what addiction could be in many different forms, whether it be pills, whether it be heroin, whether it be sex to a certain extent, hmm. and seeing how that was done in such an artful form. And it's a very difficult film to take in. It's a very difficult film to sit with. But I remember all of us like being silent afterwards and then going in depth into how like meaningful it was. And that inspired me to dive further into film outside of, you know, other films that were impactful to me. But that one was the first time where I was like, oh, you can say something like really powerful Mm -hmm. and not be afraid to do that in an indie art kind of way. Yes. So I thought uh I thought that was a nice one to share here versus my other one which is like Jurassic Park and why should I be super optimistic? I need to ground <laughs> things sometimes. <laughs> that's one that's been on my list for years and I can't make myself watch it cuz I hear something about that. I like that about oh. it every time. It's tough. I, I'll, I'll do it one of these days maybe. 
That's funny because uh, Requiem for a Dream was one I was thinking about when I was thinking about this because um, I was in college probably when I really started. I mean, I've watched movies all my life, but like really started getting into different movies um, when I was in college and racking up debt on DVDs and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and I remember Requiem for a Dream was actually one that came bundled with something else you know one of those you know two for one deals or something and i was like whatever i wanted the other movie and so i figured i'd watch this one too and i remember i remember having similar feelings uh, as you laz about requiem for a dream and you know really from there you know while i was in college i you know it was kind of anything i'd get my hands on i could watch i think i told mark one time that i'll watch about anything like I, i'm not I'm not very picky anymore <laughs> but yeah. I, you know when it comes to movies i don't like them or i don't i mean but i i'll I'll sit through them most of the time. And, yeah. you know, I even took a class in college called psychopathology in film. Uh, mm. I, was a psych, I was a psych major. My wife ended up teaching it when she was uh, a college professor as well um, years later. But uh, that was another one where it was, you know, we watched things like Remains of the Day. We watched, mm. um, wow. that's the only one I can think of off the top of my head. But, uh, you know, but a, a lot of, um, oh, uh, God, there's an old, old one. Um, Bedlam, I think was the name of the movie, but um, mm. it's an older one. But it's really cool to look back through time, like through all of history and all of cinema to see how they've portrayed different things um, from comedies, but to more serious issues to um, like psychopathology. And, you know, like you said, Laz with Requiem for a Dream with drug usage and things like that to make a really meaningful story and, you know, get an emotional reaction basically from the audience. I think when I when I discovered that in myself, that's when I really started really getting into movies. I'm a little curious about the breakdown, uh, just of the curriculum. Was <laughs> I mean, just in terms of so, I mean, for for lack of better words, was the the curriculum like okay? So this week we're going to look into I don't know depression, and we're going to study this film which focuses on depression, and we're going to look into this and look at this. Is that kind that's... of what the breakdown? Yep, that's exactly what it's like. Like we'd have a, basically a lecture, and it was it was a, a class that was meant for anybody, not just psych majors. So it was mm. a, a real high level uh, discussion lecture on certain types of mental illnesses, and yeah. then then we would watch a movie on it. And the movies weren't always like a good depiction of, of that. It was mm. sometimes more mm. of a stylized Hollywood you know, over dramatized version that maybe is yeah. doing a disservice to mental health. But then after the movie, and we would view the movie as a class. And then after the after the movie was finished, then we'd have a discussion on our thoughts about it. And maybe we'd talk about specific characters and and maybe not even the main character that was that had the mental illness that we were discussing, but you know, one that was a side character that maybe had something else that we could discuss as well. Mm. It's very, very interesting, very cool way to, you know, to look at films, but then also talk about you know, serious issues. That I would like love to class. take that class. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> you know, I grew up watching films, but it, it really was for me, I think, when my father got me uh, American Beauty. I was really young. This was when it came out. So I, I don't know how old I was at the time, but I was not of age probably to be uh, seeing it without an adult supervision. <laughs> <laughs> and there was so much I could relate to in the characters, like the character of Lester Burnham that everybody around him just thinks he's the biggest loser. Right. And here he is working on himself. And mm -hmm. then you have uh, the next door neighbor, the nerdy kid that is being accused of being gay by his father, who's closeted himself and that whole mm -hmm. dynamic and it really like on the facade of things you see the quintessential american family having their dinner and their beautiful house with a white picket fence but inside it's rot right mm -hmm. and so it was the first time in my life that i looked at the people that had because i was always growing up poor and thought oh well maybe they don't have it all together you know, and then I could start seeing myself in some of these people that beforehand I never would have related to. And the fact that that film sort of opened me up to those ideas and started changing my perception of things, I was like, oh, maybe I shouldn't just be going for, you know, the uh, the superhero movies or the action films and things like that that I'm seeing because like, yeah. I still love them. And I, you know, 
oh my god um you know mel you mentioned indian jones and i love that film it's a masterpiece a lot of people gravitate to that for a reason it's a really great film but what i'm saying is like i started specifically when i go to the movie store going to the independent section the foreign film section and i'm from rural maine so it wasn't very big but (laughs) i picked through it and i looked for all these oddball things that other people probably hadn't watched and it probably Mm. never had been rented (laughs) in my small town uh to get a sense of more of like the world around me and different ways of looking at things and that's kind of when i was like oh okay maybe i'm a little bit of a film nerd (laughs) so streaming has brought so much accessibility and reach to many films that otherwise historically wouldn't get noticed Uh, the trade-off though is that you're missing the experience of physically being in a theater so we're talking especially like uh, nowadays you know like uh, this is happening so much you know with the pandemic so many of the theaters were even closed so we couldn't get to them for like a year you know so I just want to recognize you know, the importance of seeing a film in the theater. And I'd like everybody to share with me, if you would, a memory of a time when you saw a film. It doesn't have to be your favorite film, but just saw a film in the theater, a specific memory. Okay, I'm going to share mine. And oh boy, here we go. Okay, so (laughs) movie that I saw that it's my earliest memory of a movie where I realized it could be a um, communal experience. Hmm. And that was Star Trek First Contact. Yeah? Yeah, I was, oh my God, how old was I? It was 96. So I was like, I don't know, maybe seven, maybe eight. And I remember... Me too. (laughs) And me. (laughs) I'm kidding. (laughs) I remember my mom and my stepdad, they took me to the movie and I remember sitting there and, you know, the music is playing, you know, the da, 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 da. anyway. And so they're playing the music and the credits are rolling and people started applauding when names would come up on the screen. And then I remember the big applause when Gene Roddenberry's name showed up to say, you know, first contact based on Star Trek by Gene Roddenberry. And I think I looked around me and I was like, oh, they're they're cheering for the same thing that I would be excited to see that's cool i didn't even know that you could cheer in a movie theater like i was like what is the theater etiquette and people around me were responding to the same things that i would respond to um they were inspired by the same things i would inspire i was inspired by excited by the same things i was excited by and i think that gave me permission to enjoy a film not only internally but externally because other people were doing the same thing Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's funny you say that because I had a very similar experience, uh, even though it's not my choice because I don't want to be redundant uh, with Spider-Man 2 when I saw that in theaters mm-hmm. during a midnight showing. So oh, oh, honey. midnight showings, like if, if you have like a fan crowd, it is crazy bananas awesome. Yes, it is. Like even if the film is awful, like I've seen like X Men Last Stand, like at a midnight showing, like people are just like there but respectful, like they're just reacting to everything, and there's something really magical about that. So that being said, because I love your story, another experience that was like really crazy impactful for me was watching Pixar's Up in theaters. Mm-hmm. Oh, me and an ex boyfriend uh, went to see this movie. And we went to see it in 3D. (laughs) So so we have like 3D glasses on. And for those of you that don't want to be spoiled, there's an intro sequence that is so emotional for an animated film. It'll wreck you. And I was famous tearjerker. I'm already falling through 3D glasses. I look over to my ex. He's crying. I look over to the kids next to me. The kids are crying. The parents are crying. Like everyone's crying. Oh. oh. And the fact that that film had the ability narratively to touch so many people in such, in my opinion, a a well orchestrated like montage of scenes with mm-hmm. very little dialogue is like chef's kiss in my mind. Uh, and like speaks to what is great about cinema when you can get something right. Oh, my God. Yeah, I can hear the music right now. (laughs) Well, I'll go. And mine's not so much about the movie itself. 
but about where I saw it and who I saw it mm. with, which when I was 15, um, Purple Rain came out and I was a, I still am a huge Prince fan. And, you know, I'm super white girl from the suburbs of Portland <laughs> and the only place that was playing was downtown in the city. So <laughs> my mother drove my little brother and I to go to go see it. And the theater was half full of like city people. And the other half, this was the time, I don't know if you know about the cult that happened in Portland, but the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. So the other half of the theater was full of Rajneeshis, all dressed in there, all red and purple. Oh. And I can't say which side liked it more. The whole movie, people were <laughs> cheering and talking and yelling. It was awesome. I was like, oh, so this cool. is what it's like to not be in the suburbs. It was mm. awesome. I love that. It sounds so oh, great. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna say something a little controversial, and that I don't really care much for going to the theater uh, because when I watch a movie, I like I, I'm in the movie, and and so when there's mm. other people around me, especially if they're like on their phones and stuff like that, really bugs me because uh, sure. it it does take it literally takes me out of the movie that I am oh, in. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the things that I do like, you know, when I've s- seen in theaters, um, you know, I, I like horror movies especially like jump scares i hate it but i love it and um so it's it's really you know even like like the you know the paranormal activity movies like the earlier ones where there's a lot of like kind of jump scares or just creepy things that everybody would react at the same time like kind of with a just the startled sound that everybody makes and then everyone starts laughing because we all have that reaction we're just like oh it was it was just that thing you know and, and so it's it that part to me is kind of fun to see you know, similar to some of what you all were saying too, is just seeing the same similar reactions that everyone's having, like that we're all experiencing the same thing together. And I don't know, that that's just cool because it's almost a language of its own, I guess, you know, when we're, when we're watching these movies. But, you know, I will say that one of my favorite experiences was actually just this like last weekend, Rain Man, the 35th anniversary was playing oh. on like the, uh, what do they call that? The, the, I don't know, the special exhibitions that they do that, um, you know, at the Regal like movie. One night only. Yeah, yeah. Like the one night only. And that's like one of my favorite movies of all time. So we went mm. and saw that in the theater. And that was just a cool experience because I love that movie. And then going, you know, going to something like that was yes. really fun. And uh, there was like five of us in the theater. So it's almost like a private <laughs> screening. <laughs> I was going to say that I saw in the movie theater last week, I saw Bottoms, which I thought was hysterical. And the only problem I have about seeing funny movies in theater is that I'm the loud laugher. I'm the cackler <laughs> in the back. And I, nobody else thought it was as funny as me. And I've actually been criticized by my kids. Oh, hello. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I'm just always still laughing. And then the next joke comes up. And I'm like, wait, what'd they say? And, yeah. Don't it's, hold it in. Let it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is. I ha- I know that. Okay. I know the strike is still happening. So I'm going to be careful. But all I want to say is that it was hilarious. That's all I'm going to say. I'm but I have not out. said that. Sorry. It I, is hysterical. It's I'm dying to see it personally. Oh, yeah. Man. Oh, I'm a man. huge AO at a berry fan and man is she oh. having a year here. Well, when I was thinking about the question, I think Mel, you had said uh that it wasn't so much about the movie itself that you went to see. Yeah. And I I want to say it's the same about me. Like I have a very vivid memory. I was like uh, I was living in uh, Miami Beach and I didn't know anybody and I had moved there with just I think I had $500 in my pocket and that's it and I didn't have a job had nothing and I just moved there didn't know anybody and um, within a week like I found a job and, and what have you but again I didn't know anybody right so I was like working and, and living at a ho- youth hostel and, and what have you oh and um, oh it was that's great like it was that. so much fun so yeah, I've I, never. Oh, sorry. I, I had some uh, Australian guys for roommates, um, and uh, we're still friends this day. Um, but anyway, there there was a theater at the end of. If you go to Miami Beach, there's Lincoln Road Mall. It's an outdoor mall, and mm-hmm. um, it's great tourist trap. You know, uh, love Lincoln Road because all kinds of different shops and restaurants and what have you. But at the end, there is a theater there. I think it might just be Lincoln Road Theater. Anyway. They have so many different theaters there. And so they show all the big movies, but then occasionally they show oddball stuff. And um, I remember, like I said, it's not about the film. Uh, It was a movie that came out. I think it was uh, called Factory Girl. Um, And it was about story of uh, E.D. Sedgwick, uh, who was a muse of Andy Warhol and what have you. And I was like, oh, I'm curious about this, you know, because, of course, she sort of dated briefly Bob Dylan and Dylan wrote songs about her and. 
I was just like very intrigued by the whole the whole Wasn't concept. That Sienna Miller in it? Yes. Yep. Exactly. Um and I forget who played Warhol, but they did a good job. Anyway, so I wanted to go see that. So I saw there was a showing when I was getting off work and it might have been late. It might have been like 11 p.m. But I think that that theater was just open forever because I don't know it's Miami. Everything's open late. And I went to see it. And that was the very first time in my life I go into a theater and there was no one. There was no one. <laughs> and I laughed and I put my legs up over the chair in yeah. front of me and I stretched <laughs> my arms out. And I'm just like, oh, this is great. It's like my damn living. <laughs> yeah. And I remember feeling the sense of like, I'm such a nerd that I'm doing this. I'm the only person in all of South Beach, Miami that wants to see this film right now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the film itself, it was, you know, it, it was all right. It wasn't a bad film. I, I like Casey. I like most films. There's very few that I'm like, oh, that was awful. Like I'm entertained. Even the bad films, like I, I'm, I can be entertained. And so for that one, I don't remember being wowed, but I remember being entertained. Oh, and Hayden Christensen was in it. He played Bob Dylan. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. I think wasn't Guy Pierce. Uh, oh, I think Guy Pierce was yeah, uh Andy Andy Warhol. Warhol. Yeah. yeah. What a weird I've, cast. I've, I've been I've been keeping my mouth shut. I worked on the key art for that film. <gasps> oh, yes. oh my word. And I'm sorry, Mark, oh, it's a really bad movie. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, have you heard the gay gasp oh, that Mark Lord. and I just had? Nah, it's fine. It's a good movie. It's good. It's entertaining. <laughs> I liked it. Because when you do key art on something, you have to end up watching it like 80 million times. Oh, oh no, that's too many. Yeah. It was, like my, it was my first job doing entertainment advertising. Oh, uh, my gosh. For a company called Indica Entertainment Advertising. Indica. And they did like, some, some Was there a sativa? <laughs> I was going to say. That's specific. <laughs> so it was a, it was a, a fun thing. It was to a watch real film. Over and over it was over. an experience. <laughs> it was a film. <laughs> this is a good segue into the next topic. Uh, <laughs> so there is a clear difference between cinema as art and movies as a product to be consumed. And when I think about cinema as art, my head immediately goes to directors, the amount of times I've gone to see a film because of the director attached. But I've also done the same thing for uh, different actors or writers of a film uh, that I think are just good writers or good actors. So uh, if everybody can uh, share with the group an experience of watching a production, not for the story per se, but maybe for the creative hands behind it, where you're like, oh, this person's in there, that person's associated with it, I'm going to watch it. I always bring her up. I call her my Hollywood mother because I want to work with her one day so bad. <laughs> Violet Davis, whatever she does, I will I will go see. There is something um, that is, you know, and every actor has their own style uh, and their own way that they approach the work and, and, and all those different things. Um, there is something about Viola Davis that uh, whenever she does something in a role, she comes from a very personal place mm -hmm. that I'm watching the performance. And there's something about the performance where I say to myself, okay, there's Viola. Viola is in this right now. And I don't mm -hmm. mean that in a way as um, here's an actor just doing the thing that they do in every movie. It's Viola is pulling from a very personal place i don't know what that is but i always i'm looking in her eyes and i'm saying to myself okay what what did she go through to yeah. to get there like what happened to you and i think that is that's a privilege to to see and i think that kind of that kind of commitment to the work and bringing that kind of uh, stuff to the work will make me want to watch you over and over and over mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. i mean her tiny little role in the movie doubt have you seen that oh my god Oh, I mean, so come good. on. Yep. That role, that part and her performance in that movie, I was instantly a fan. I'll watch and, anything with her. It's amazing. She was there for what, 15 minutes? Yes, if that. She steals the whole movie. And she's got Meryl in that movie. Mm -hmm. I read this question a few times and I had a tough time navigating it personally for myself. So I'm going to mm. kind of give a controversial slash non-answer in that I don't tend to attach myself too much to either an actor, director, uh, a production artist, whatever it might mm. be, because 
I think that depending on circumstances, whether it be studio interference or, mm -hmm. you know, whether it just be like a bad day or mm -hmm. you know, perhaps like everything just didn't gel. I don't judge things on one specific merit and that doesn't drive me to the theater. I think what does is if I see or hear something about it that feels like it would connect with me, whether it be mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. themes, the stories, who's involved, I'll go for that. But it's not mutually exclusive for me. It's just, mm -hmm. again, everything aligning, I can kind of feel whether I'm going to enjoy that experience. Mm. Like that. Um, right now I'm this is Melissa. Hi. I'm gravitating towards I'm the only girl. I don't know why I said that, but um gravitating. <laughs> Bye, Melissa, towards... announce yourself. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am watching movies directed by women. I'm seeking them out and I'm really noticing big differences in movies between men and women directors. And I I mean I could list ten right now, but I'm trying to seek them out because they, the pacing is different. Mm. That the the way that they make the female characters have their own agency is different. Um, I recently saw After Sun, and it's not really about a woman, but man, I instantly knew a woman had directed it. I think her name's mm -hmm. Charlotte Wells is the director, and it's just so beautifully done. It's such a kind of a feminine perspective on what a man is going through, and. Mm. Yeah, that's my thing now. I will watch a movie and seek them out. I also love Cleo from Five to Seven, which is an old movie by Agnes Barda, I think is her name, French director. Mm -hmm. And it's also just so like, yeah, a woman made this movie and I love it. Thank you, by the way, for sharing that. I think it's so important to recognize stories that are coming from different, diverse perspectives. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a slow movement with that. I, mm -hmm. I don't think quick enough, but thank you for sharing the female perspective on that and what it means to you to you know, you. just have that experience and yeah. to recognize those elements within a film. There are a lot of fantastic Black women directors right now, and I especially gravitate towards them. There's a movie called The 40-Year-Old Version, not Virgin, but Version, written mm. by Radha Blank. She also star stars in it. It's fantastic. There's a new British movie. It's on Hulu called Rye Lane. And it has a woman director named Rain and I think Ann Miller, Rain Miller or something. And it's also fantastic. It's just to the women in the movies are so centered and, and grounded. It's awesome. That's awesome. I do actually have, and it, it builds up over time, but you know, like favorite directors, like that I will always watch their movies like David Fincher is probably my all-time favorite director, and I, ha I haven't seen his. Fincher. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't seen his newest one yet, but um, mm -hmm. I, I love the the darkness, the grittiness of of his movies. Um, you know, Christopher Nolan is another one, and I have not seen Oppenheimer yet, which makes oh. me a, a bad Nolan fan. I know. I have another. Um, <laughs> but... I have another. <laughs> hey, listen, uh, you guys can still listen to the podcast. Uh, it well... was the last episode that dropped, I think. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> but you know, and and I I love how, you know, for his, you know, you're always going to get like these big stories, um, and um, really thought provoking things, um, and. I don't know why I'm I've, I'm surprising myself by this, but Ben Affleck is actually uh, another director who I, I haven't watched everything that he's directed yet, but I can say with some certainty that almost everything I've watched of his that he's directed, I have loved. Like the um, the town. Yeah. I want to say cool. um, Argo. Argo. Yes. Thank you. Yes, that one I, I've rewatched that one. Argo recently. was great. Yeah, it was good. Air was surprisingly good you know about making the air jordans it's it's <laughs> it, yeah it, it surprisingly good but <laughs> i don't know why i'm oh, why i'm surprised that. yeah yeah, yeah. Did. and so um i'm you know he's another one that when i see that he's directed something it, it goes on my watch list he, he's not up to that like okay i gotta do what i whatever i can to watch it but mm -hmm. um oddly enough though I, I haven't done that with like writers you know i've got my favorite composers but i'm not going to necessarily go see a movie just because somebody's composed the music mm. for it you know there, there's a handful of writers that when i see their names come up on the screen i know that i'm probably going to like this but yeah i definitely get drawn to directors that's for sure mm. well yeah for me um i feel like yeah i think it's just through track record through watching a lot of like oddball stuff 
from the bargain bins uh, <laughs> that I'm like, oh, well, this actor's been in this, in this, in this, in this that I have enjoyed. And so I'll see their name and be like, okay, I'll, I will check it out. And it's the same with like directors too. It's like, oh, like I remember I watched that really weird thing and it might not be my favorite <laughs> film, but it was really weird and thought provoking. I'm like, oh, I, I liked that. And so I'll just rattle off a couple right now. And I'll just say, uh, Johnny Depp. Yes, I know he did the Pirates movies for Disney, but before that, he had a very long career in oddball things, and Mm -hmm. I'm happy to see he's gone back to doing oddball things, and however you feel about him personally or his personal life or whatever (laughs) is up with that, I have enjoyed his films. And then Jim Jarmusch. Do you guys know him? Love him. Yeah. Very Uh, interesting little movies. Jim Jarmusch? Yeah. So... Dead Man was the first film I saw by him and Johnny Depp stars in it. And uh, it's just this really rich story about um, this guy. He's traveling out west to start a new life after his family died. And uh, he ends up getting there only to find out he doesn't have a job. And then, you know, this whole thing unfurls. But he befriends this Native American guy and the actor uh, Gary Farmer is one of the most famous uh, and celebrated Native American actors actually in working in cinema. He's been he's been working most of his life in cinema. He has so many credits. Uh, so it's worth it for Gary Farmer's performance. Uh, but he plays a character, a Native American character called Nobody. And uh, Nobody, he learned to read English uh, through reading poetry. And... Um, shoot this is one of my favorite films and i'm drawing a blank right now but uh the poet's name is also the same name as johnny depp's character and so Mm. he thinks it's a reincarnation of this poet and he thinks that it's him william and so they befriend each other and they travel the whole movie together and it's black and white and ever since i saw that film i started watching jim jarmusch's other stuff and he's done all kinds of different genres. Like yeah. he just did a yeah. zombie film, The Dead Don't Die. Uh, yep. And before that, he did one um, that was really good. That was a vampire film. <laughs> yeah. Uh, He's really interesting, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it, it, all of his movies are really slow burn character yeah. oh, studies yeah. with great dialogue. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine being exposed to a language by just reading the poetry and mm-hmm. how that just informs how you speak, how you think? in text and how you you know how you write a, how you write a letter his character's <laughs> dialogue through most of the film are quotes from this particular poet's Ugh. book of poetry oh my god but they were all nature related that, so he's talking about trees wow. and the water and the sky and all this but it through poems that were written by this guy that you know has died love it i saw <laughs> broken flowers with bill murray and i love it you saw what Jim Jarm- Broken Flowers with Bill Murray. Oh, that's right. He did that one too. He, oh, I love that movie. So good. It is good. Bill Murray in a serious role will get me every time. I love mm. it. He made Bill Murray made like this that transition from comedic to seriousness mm-hmm. or to drama rather. Yeah. Later on in his, I mean, it was always there, obviously. Yep. Yeah. Um, but that was a very that's a very interesting. Whenever I see a, an actor make that make that transition, it's it's always just it's a very interesting one to watch, and it's great. You know, for me, it's like oh that, that that was always there, you know, and it's I don't know, it's always very interesting to see. I like Ro- that. Robin, Robin Williams is a really good yeah yeah yes. <laughs> um, oh God, that movie. Uh, oh, what is the movie about that? Uh, the person that develops uh, oh, film one hour like photo. A, oh, one hour. Oh, that's scary. I watched that movie way too young. Yeah. yeah. But, that was the first time that I saw Robin Williams and said, oh, oh, okay. this is what he can do. Yes. That's oh, my such God. A yeah. Oh, the poet's name was William Blake. It just hit me oh. like a lightning rod. So it was William <laughs> Blake. And I actually went out and bought an old, old from a um, antique shop book of William Blake's poems because of the movie. Anyway. Oh, wow. And that's how I discovered that the lines were from the poems. <laughs> oh. That's cool. Uh, After the fact, I like that. <laughs> But uh, so we have Casey joining this week. And something I learned about Casey is that Casey enjoys films that were uh, also based on books. And so I thought it would be great to ask everybody, uh, what is one book 
to film adaptation that worked and one that did not. I love Pride and Prejudice so much. I could watch it. I do watch it monthly. I like the version with uh, Kira Knightley. I've crushed on Matthew McFadden for years and years. <laughs> I mean, I think for like 20 years. I love him so much. And that movie just every time I cry, I laugh. I'm like, how am I laughing? I've seen this 20 times, but it's so perfectly perfect to me. I just love it. And it's so it's so true to the book and it captures that same spirit. I think Jane Austen wouldn't even like it. My one I didn't like was, oh, what's the one, the girl on the train and it mm. she sees a mm. she sees a murder. Is that it? What it's called? Emily Emily Blunt's in the movie. I loved the book, but the movie was not great. Mm. For me personally. It didn't live <laughs> up to the book. That's why you forgot the title because it was that bad. <laughs> I know. I think it's a girl on a train. I really do. But I, I'm Google search sure, girl right. on a train, Emily Blunt, and then don't yeah. watch that movie, listeners. <laughs> I mean, you might, but don't read the book first. Oh. <laughs> and it's got, who's that who's super hot guy in it? I mean, the, even they couldn't make it. <laughs> even they couldn't make it good. Now I'm curious. Who's the super hot guy? I'm just going to yeah, look it up. <laughs> look it up, slide in his DMs, maybe see if he's on Grinder. I don't know. It's the girl on the train. Let me be very specific. And the hot guy is, well, Justin Theroux's in it. But I was talking Ooh. about, I was talking about Luke Evans. Holy hell, Luke Ooh, Evans. The Evanses. Mm. Oh, Luke Evans. Oh, yeah. honey. I watch um Doctor Tree, Doctor T, and the Wonder Women. Oh boy, is he hot in that movie? That's a hot movie. Noted. You know who to Noted. go to for some <laughs> hot men films. <laughs> Uh-huh. Mel, uh, sidebar: Have you seen Chocolate City? No, I've never oh, even heard. It's kind of it's kind God, of a, a trashy version of Magic Mike <laughs> with an all can't. black cast. And oh my oh, God, I just so watch it for the man candy. The I'm man not, candy is can't. all that you need to watch in that movie. It's Ch- it's not for Chocolate the plot. City. Chocolate City, I'm and it is so city. good oh. for the man candy. Okay, <laughs> that's enough for me. Um, one that I think that maybe didn't make the transition as well, and I don't want to poo poo on, I don't like to poo poo on on work in in because I don't know what happened behind the scenes. I'll just I will say that what I what didn't seem to transition well, whatever the situation was, or maybe whatever the intention was behind the art that just didn't seem to to transition well. Fahrenheit four fifty one. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a. A version of it that came out i think it was did it go directly to hbo it did and i remember the book and i remember watching the movie and kind of being excited and i think that there i think there were just things that were missed and i think it was the details the details of the book which i think were probably the most important i think didn't make it into the movie and i mean that's that's always a challenge when you're trying to make that transition from book to film you know what what are you going to keep? What are you going to take out? Because you have, what, two hours, maybe three, two and a half to tell this story of a book that people read over two weeks, however long, you know. So it's not an easy transition. But I think Fahrenheit 451 was one that just didn't really make the make the transition well. And I think it was the emotional impact of the social commentary that just didn't hit me as much. That's one that sticks out to me. I will jump in. So, Casey, you mentioned horror earlier. Everyone knows I'm the designated horror aficionado within Cinema Z. And I'm going to keep this as more of a blanket statement because I was speaking about it at length recently. I think that Stephen King is such a good example of somebody who has had amazing adaptations and really poorly done adaptations for a variety of reasons. Mm. This could be an entire episode within itself because <laughs> I have feelings on even, you know, The Shining, uh, you know, versus the book and whatnot. But I will say something I've realized is that newer remakes on perhaps films that were done in like the 70s, 80s based on his work have lost a certain soul i think that when Mm. you decide to take his work and make it glossy Mm -hmm. or try to add too much unnecessary aspects to it and not Mm -hmm. focus on the depth of his storytelling Mm -hmm. you start to really take out that soul so i think something like it 
uh, the remake from 2017, I want to say. Uh, yeah, that's about right. I think because it was set in the 80s, even though that's not the time period of the book, it still retained a lot of that grit and that genuine feel of Stephen King. And I mm. think if you compare it to something like the remake of Carrie that came out with uh, uh. Julianne Moore, Chloe Grace Moretz, or even uh, Pet Cemetery recently, the new remake, you just lose all that soul, all that like rich, dark tension. So that is my answer. That's a good mm. answer. Good yeah. answer. Yeah, that's a very good answer. I'd even say that, you know, Dr. Sleep was, it was a faithful adaptation of the book as, as much as they could, because the book is very long. They have to cut it down, obviously. But the actual movie experience, I, I it was, it, it's not the same. You know, it wasn't. I didn't find it scary. It was interesting. It had a had an interesting story to it. But yeah, I uh, Stephen King's I, got got a wide wide body of work. To, to I adore yeah. the director of Doctor Sleep, Mike Mike Flanagan. I think his mm. work is so beautifully done, and like the attention to detail that he puts into script and performances and stuff like that is great. But I I agree with you with that one as well. Like there's something like about his work. It's just hard to nail that like dark simplicity. I think yeah. I think I liked it because I liked The Shining and they they very much bookend each other. So I think that's the yeah. sole reason I enjoyed it. Well, the thing that the thing that the movie Dr. Sleep did very well was bridging the gap between the book, The Shining and the movie, The, uh, the Stanley Kubrick, The Shining, uh, because that movie was so different from the book, especially how it ends, that they had to figure out how to you know work that in. And the book is a sequel to the book, you know, so. I'm so was, curious uh, now. I never, I've seen, I mean, I saw The Shining a very long time ago, but I'm very curious. Now. Stephen King seen... famously hated Stanley Kubrick's take on oh, that film. Yeah. I didn't now know that's that. some tea. But what did he say? <laughs> he really did enjoy Dr. Sleep. Yes, he did. He did? Because mm -hmm. of what Casey said, there was a bridge to it, and to get that funded, it was easier to use kind of the crux of the original Shining have that in there but it wasn't the full like that wasn't the crux of the story the story mm. remained like the book and they used imagery from Kubrick mm -hmm. yes yeah but the actors they got to play the original actors so good oh my god <laughs> all of them I don't know who that yeah. black guy was but he looked like the guy from The Shining oh, it was Carl Lumbly like oh. yeah Carl Lumbly oh, um, okay. yeah he I was I was like they didn't get Scatman Crothers back. I'm pretty sure he died. <laughs> yeah. Right? He'd be like 100 now. I know, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Also, yeah. fun fact, listeners, Henry Thomas plays Jack Torrance, mm -hmm. Dr. That's, Sleep, that's... and he was Elliot in E.T. Yes, he was. Elliot. <laughs> my, my mind was just blown. <laughs> oh. Well, kind of like we were talking with Dr. Sleep, there's there's really good adaptations, but they don't always necessarily make for a decent movie. And I think one that I didn't really care for was the Da Vinci Code. The The book was, I, I you know, I was, I was in there with the whole, you know, I read it when it came out, just like everybody else Same, did. So yes. I was super excited for the movie. And the movie was decent. Like it, it was almost a page by page, you know, movie of the book um but yeah. it just i don't know it it lost something in that translation it did. um you know and and i think sometimes the i don't know when you when you have a character that's so smart like that it it's so unrealistic especially so when you see it on screen you see somebody actually like spouting all this stuff off i'm like nobody's like that you know <laughs> but also uh, tom hanks's hair is so bad enough yeah i don't know what they were thinking yeah. with that but uh not yeah. the commentary on the hair <laughs> bringing the hair back it's it's like a mullet but not i don't know it's yeah. it's weird um it's very bad it's yeah. like a guy who's had short hair his whole life who decided to grow it out and doesn't know what to do that yeah. kind of <laughs> yes exactly but you know ones that ones that i really like um and i don't always uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna go on record here and say i don't always read the book first i a lot of times i'll actually see a movie and say and see the credit where it says based on the book by and then i after i see the movie if i like the movie enough then i'll go and and read the book and me too you know fight club was one of those for me that i loved the movie uh when i first saw it i saw it late i saw it when i was in college and i guessed how it ended 
within the first 15 minutes and the people I was watching it with who had seen it were pissed off and they're like you, you swear you haven't seen this and I was like yeah no why and they're like never mind just watch but I, I went and read the book and then you know the movie did a very good job of adapting that book and but the book itself is also very it's a quick read it's a very you know mm-hmm. easy read but it's fast paced you know like the movie and everything like Silence of the Lambs Hannibal like those are ones too that I, I really loved um, and i I Hannibal and Hannibal Rising are both I read both of those before the movies came out but those movies aren't exactly super faithful I mean they're they're faithful yeah. in, in spirit but there's a lot that happens in the books that mm-hmm. they chose not to do for the movies probably for good reasons yeah um, dark yeah I mean, dark enough <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um the show is pretty amazing yeah I only saw like the first season of that I, I didn't uh I didn't get very far I, I I need to I want to but I just never did but yeah so Apparently, I, I like really dark things, too, I guess. I, I, I you're like, in good company. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I was about to say, your laws is right there with you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I wrote the question. <laughs> I wrote the question specifically for Casey, in my defense. <laughs> I don't know really what I would answer. Uh, I've got a couple of things that come to mind. The first one that comes to mind is Brokeback Mountain for a Weird Way. Um the short story, the book itself, I actually did not like. So I'm going to complain about the book here. Um, I saw the movie first, thought it was just beautiful and heart wrenching. And then I went and read the book. And maybe it's because it was such a short story. I don't remember my critique, but I remember really not liking the book, mm. oddly enough. So I'm glad it get turned into a film and the film was great. And the second one, I will say, and this was this is the positive one, because that one was kind of negative, I guess. I don't know. The positive one, I will say, is The Hours, which oh, also is a book. And yes. um, the book is beautiful and the film is beautiful. And um, yeah, it gives me all of the feels, both. Uh, and it actually inspired me to, after I read The Hours and after I watched The Hours, I went and I bought the book, Mrs. Dalloway, which yep. again was kind of crap. I, I didn't <laughs> enjoy Mrs. Dalloway, the book, but I appreciated its contribution to literature. So we'll say that. <laughs> oh, Brokeback Mountain. Um, Brokeback um, Mountain, for someone that um, was freshly coming out and into their own and um, had not had certain sexual experiences there is a scene in Brokeback Mountain where these two people are having intercourse for the first time and being a young, gay, twinkish 18-year-old, I was petrified. <gasps> I was very scared. Anyway, oofta. Moving forward, as cinema is an art, like great art has the potential to move us, inspire us, or change us. Is there a piece of cinema that has inspired you, changed you, or made a permanent effect on you in your life? The Matrix is mine. I talk about it a lot, I know. But I think for me, something that I've been trying to to work into my life now that I, even as I get older is the power of thought, acknowledging the power of your words and how that stuff manifests itself in in life and i think the matrix has a way that the first one has a way of really uh speaking to to that idea and and this foreshadowing to what we're going to do in a few minutes but there's a there's a moment where neo and morpheus are talking to each other and uh bottom line is uh neo says to morpheus are you telling me one day i'm going to be able to dodge bullets and morpheus says to him one day you won't have to and it's not that this person is bulletproof necessarily, but it's just speaking to the the power of this that this being has, the unta- untapped potential. And I think that's what I'm trying to get down to is untapped potential mm-hmm. and the power that your your thoughts can have to to uh, to access un- untapped potential. And I think that's something that the Matrix speaks to very well. And uh, ever since I've seen that movie, uh, that's a theme that is spoken to me and i think i try to apply that to my life every day mine is going to be out of left field and bonkers but still on brand it continues to this day to be a nightmare on elm street the first one 
I have said this before many times. I saw this film when I was about three and a half years old and fell in love with it. And as I've hinted at before, my my family dynamic was all over the place. Dad issues. Then my mom became a single mom, like a lot of stuff. But what I loved about that film, as it was created and written by Wes Craven, was that it wasn't about what that franchise became, which was Freddy Krueger and like, okay, like spooky, spooky. It was really about the resilience of the female character, Nancy Thompson, played by Heather Langenkamp. And throughout that entire film, she's like seeing all her friends meet some sort of demise. And throughout it, she is constantly overcoming and trying to find solutions to this problem, which happens to be in the form of the villainous Freddy Krueger. And there's a moment where she and her boyfriend, who are the only survivors left, uh, standing on a bridge, and her boyfriend's played by Johnny Depp in his first I was going to say, that's another Johnny Depp movie. Uh Uh-huh. And he's sitting there and they're they're having this very poetic conversation about like survival and all this stuff and you know he's kind of saying like well you know i ignore it and she's reading this booklet it's like a manual that teaches you how to do like handmade booby traps Hmm. and he's like you're a wackadoo like what are you doing (laughs) and she just turns up to him and says i'm into survival Hmm. and from there on the film becomes her chasing her villain effectively like the problem and taking it down herself because nobody believes her her parents aren't there etc etc so that always stuck uh with me as a female character that took a circumstance into her own hands and made it Mm. just her own experience like no more i'm done with this i'm sick of it (laughs) And uh, and I, I felt like that was something that was powerful then to me and still remains true today. Mm. It's like a, the, fi- the original final girl. I love that. Uh-huh. Um, so I was going to say Talladega Nights just to be funny, but that's not true. It's, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, Mike Mills written and directed movie 20th Century Women. I don't know if you've mm. seen that. It's no, I- fantastic. Fantastic. He also um, made the movie Beginners. I don't know if you've seen that. I think you guys would like it. Oh. uh, It's about his dad. And then 20th Century Women is about his mom, essentially. Annette Bening, Elle Fanning, Greta. Hello, Greta is an actress. And it's about the 70s and in California. And she essentially asks these other women to help her influence her son to be a feminist. And how they do that, especially in the 70s and what that means, the sex books he reads, he's like 15, the son is. And it's so well written. It's so, so beautiful. And I can't watch it enough. It it influenced this whole quest I'm on now for watching female directors, even though Mike Mills isn't a female. But I, I can't say enough about how what it says about women and feminism. And I highly recommend it. It changed my whole course on what i'm going to start watching as movies so also single mom so i can relate raising boys oh girl yeah three i'm boys. not saying like I, i'm not i'm not a mom and i but i i know that i put my mom through through some stuff i'm just saying i know <laughs> i know i did so <laughs> it's, i don't know what i would do with girls at this point but yes boys you. are very physically challenging i'll just yes, say that are. girls are emotional not to be super stereotypical but boys express anger and happiness through physicality and it is exhausting right. matt your mom deserves an award just for cleaning all your tube socks you know what <laughs> i don't appreciate this read <laughs> being read cover to cover yes she does but <laughs> i don't appreciate the read sir <laughs> <laughs> well um I've got two actually, so I'll try to keep them short. The first one um, was actually introduced to me by my wife when she was teaching her psychopathology in film class. Um, and it's Lars and the Real Girl. And I, I always tease her about it because um, she does not do sad movies or or heartfelt. You know, she doesn't like, you know, kind of feeling those emotions. I, t- I tend to like that. But um, but she told me she's like, OK, so you'd really like this movie. 
and I was like, I don't know. It looks, it looks sad. Like, you know, like I don't necessarily want to get myself into that, but you know, but uh, she's like, no, it's not at all. And so I was like traveling for work and it was on Netflix or something like that. And so I was in a hotel room and, and watched it and was just like bawling the whole time because it, you know, it's, it's a touching movie. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, I think the, the, the big theme that I pull out of that is just how, you know, kindness can uh, be so impactful to people mm-hmm. that, um, you know, you think of a, a guy who's, who's going through something in his life where he ends up quote unquote dating a sex doll, but the whole community that that he lives in, you know, comes around and supports him and treats this doll as a real person, you know, mm-hmm. until it's time to help him let go of that. And it's just so touching and, you know, heartwarming and everything. And, and so, you know, for me, like just the, the power of kindness, you know, as expressed in that movie is, is great. Kind of on a, a different side of that <laughs> is um, Shattered Glass, which mm-hmm. I think is, um, such a great example and it's based on a true story based ish on a true story um but you know about a real person who basically made up stories and called them news and yes mm. it, it's such a stressful movie to watch you know watching somebody lie their way through life about everything and trying to keep them straight and not being able to and you know my own life i'm i'm sure i lie from time to time but there there's so many you know scenarios that you can get yourself out of if you just give a little lie you know like it wasn't my fault or i don't know you could come up with a, a million different things to, that you could lie about but you know at the end of the day when you really kind of get down to you know you're in that moment like should i lie about this or should i own up to it and i've found in my life and you know this this movie kind of shows the exact opposite of that but it's like if you just own up to you know mistakes or you know whatever it is things can go so much better for you. And, you know, that movie just exemplifies like things can go so bad for you, you know, if you are, you know, pathological liar. So, you know, not that that movie taught me not to lie, but, you know, it's just, <laughs> you know, a good, I for me, you know, just always a good reminder of if you lie once, you've got to you remember it forever because, you know, like you're going to always have to, It's it could come up anytime. And so is it worth it? Probably not. Well, I was spinning uh, my wheels on this one. Um, again, I wrote the questions. I don't know why I didn't prepare <laughs> anything, but this one actually um, came up in a conversation with Laz recently. And so I thought I would bring this movie up. Nico 1988. Hmm. Um, and it's a story of uh, Nico from the Velvet Underground fame. Um, but the story is very much not Nico in the Velvet Underground because it's her life story after the Velvet Underground and how she despised almost the fame of being known as the ingenue from Velvet Underground and how she was used by everybody around her for being beautiful and pretty and how she rebelled against it and just uh, not necessarily let herself go, but stopped focusing on her physical attributes And started focusing on her musical career and what she Mm. wanted to do. And there's a line in the film that was like um, something to the effect of, I like myself more now that I'm ugly or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw the movie at (laughs) a very, very, very dark time in my life where I didn't know how I would go on um or yeah if that was even going to happen and um i was very lonely and Mm. i watched this film about this woman that was used up by society and spit out as though she was trash essentially and she pulled herself up and built her own career and sort of shunned fame she wasn't really giving interviews with people she just uh, she got like a small tour bus and a bunch of junkies that knew how to play instruments. And she toured mm-hmm. Europe and she herself was an addict, but she was, you know, trying to um, to, you know, wean herself off that uh, and not let it affect her relationship with her son. That was her whole world. And it's this beautiful story, I would say, of triumph, because we talk about the here in the podcast, how important that is. Now, this is one of those examples of the film that tells the story of her triumph and her succeeding in her dreams 
and her passion. And it does tell at the end, you know, sort of how her life continued after the film. And so there's that little the blurb after. But the message of it and the meaning of that is is triumphed. And I always found this film to be very uplifting. And whenever I watch it, I feel inspired in this sense of, okay, no matter what everybody else around me is saying about me, no matter what I'm going through right now, I can prevail if I dig my feet in and follow my heart and my gut of who I know that I am and who I, I know I can be. And, uh, and so, yeah, for me, that's Nico 1988 and it's available for free on Hulu. If you haven't seen it, just it. listed it looks fantastic. Yeah. Mm. So, Oh, and the woman that plays Nico sings all of the songs and the Ooh. soundtrack's amazing. And she sounds just like Nico. So it's great. Totally awesome. check it out people. Now this leads us to my favorite segment and yours. <laughs> 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 director's cut uh and so for this episode uh matt and i both picked a couple scenes from some of our favorite films and we are going to act them out without any practice unscripted <laughs> we're oh, going <boy>. raw <laughs> and now we're pleased to bring you our feature presentation So uh, the first one I have here, the scene is from American Beauty. And there is a few parts here. So I actually would like to be Carolyn uh, Burnham here. And uh, there is uh, client one and client two. So whoever wants to do either. I just want to be Carolyn. <laughs> oh, I'll do one. I'll, I could be client one. Now, this scene is... Uh, <laughs> And this is for you, Amy Nelson. Um, this scene is we have Carolyn Burnham, who is a real estate agent, and she's showing potential buyers a house. And Andy and I, my partner, uh, we quote this scene to each other constantly. We have since we met, actually. We just we both, for whatever reason, are extremely amused by this scene. That's and so, so uh, when I was thinking about scenes for this pod, I was like, all right, I'll grab that one because it's funny. All right. Action. I will sell this house today. Welcome. I'm Carolyn Burnham. This living room is very dramatic. But wait until you see the native stone fireplace. Cream would really lighten this place up. You could even put in skylights. The kitchen, a dream come true for any cook. We were told this pool was lagoon-like. There's nothing lagoon-like about it. Except the bugs. There aren't even any plants out here. Well, what do you call this? Is this not a plant? If you have a problem with the plants, I can always call my landscape architect. When I think lagoons, I think tropical. This is a cement hole. Uh, I have some tiki torches in my garage. <laughs> shut up! Shut up! Baby, shut up! Shut up! Cut. Thank you. <laughs> and I just worked out some shit. <laughs> <laughs> and here is a uh, scene number two, listeners. You won't be surprised. It is from The Matrix. Here's a little bit of backstory for this scene. Morpheus educates Neo on the nature of the Matrix and his place in it. Action. The Matrix is a system, Neo. That system is our enemy. But when you're inside the Matrix, you look around. What do you see? Business people, teachers, lawyers, carpenters. The very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so injured, so helplessly dependent on the system that they will fight to protect it. Were you listening to me, Neo? Or were you looking at the woman in the red dress? I was. Look again. Freeze it. This, this isn't the Matrix? No. It's another training program designed to teach you one thing. If you're not one of us, you're one of them. What are they? Sentient programs. They can move in and out of any software still hardwired to their system. That means that anyone we haven't unplugged is potentially an agent. Inside the Matrix, they are everyone and they are no one. We, are survived by, we have survived by hiding from them, by running from them, 
they are the gatekeepers. They are guarding all the doors. They are holding all the keys, which means that sooner or later, someone is going to have to fight them. Someone? I won't lie to you, Neo. Every single man or woman who has stood their ground, everyone who has fought an agent has died. But where they have failed, you will succeed. Why? I have seen an agent punch through a concrete wall. Men have emptied entire clips at them and hit nothing but air. Yet their strength and their speed are still based in a world that is built on rules. Because of that, they will never be as strong or as fast as you can be. What are you trying to tell me? That I can dodge bullets? No, Neo. I am trying to tell you that when you're ready, you won't have to. Cut. I love that scene so much. It gives me chills. It's just so <laughs> freaking cool. I need to rewatch it now. Untapped potential. That is like the thing that I take away from this movie all the time. Untapped potential and tapping into that. Yeah. You sound just like Morpheus, too. That was really, really good. Hero. It was really good. Yeah. Nicely done. You've practiced that. You're not supposed to practice. <laughs> you <laughs> my Siri now. <laughs> I, I'd make a lot of money and I wouldn't have to do security anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so y'all, I'm going to debut a brand new segment this week. Uh, we are replacing trivia because uh, we have no movie to discuss. So instead, we're going to have a trivia game. So mm -hmm. I have a list of uh, trivia questions here. And um, we are going to, I guess, <laughs> you can shout out like me or I got it or whatever if you have the answer. And I'll go off who I heard first because we don't have anything sophisticated like a buzzer. Sound good? <laughs> That'll be next season. We'll um, we'll add a buzzer and it'll yes. be in the budget for next season. Exactly. <laughs> not, <laughs> not this season. <laughs> okay. And uh, so I got... 10 questions and one bonus question. And uh, the bonus question is m worth double the points. So two points. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All for funsies. Okay. So question one. Blank is one of three African-American actresses. The other being Whoopi Goldberg and Angela Bassett to be nominated for an Academy Award in both the Best Actress and Best Supporting Actress categories. I know. Mel? Viola Davis? That is correct. <laughs> One point to Mel. Nice. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> Question two. For this film, no opening credits for actors, writers, producers, director, etc. are shown, with the story being taking place right after the title. Although... By the 1990s, it had become quite common for major films to not have opening credits. It was still unusual in 1968. What was this film? Bro, I don't know. I I want to guess Nor the one with Norman Bates. What's that movie called? Oh, Psycho. 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 I'm thinking 2001. Mm -hmm. Bing, 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 bing. <laughs> Casey's yeah. got it. 2001: A Space Odyssey. Who do nice. think that was? Kubrick. Cuba. Yeah. Kubrick. My father. Yes. Laz is dead. <laughs> all right. Ooh. This is, oh. I, I, I picked them according to, to you all. So I, I'm so <laughs> I'm so thrilled. Anyway, <laughs> development executive Lindsay Doran loved the film finished script and advocated for it to be made at Embassy Pictures and then at Paramount Pictures after she became vice president of production there in 1985. She was told each time that there was no more demand for Stephen King films after a slew of adaptations from his novels released in the early 80s. It was only during the 1988 Writers Guild of America strike, see I roped in the strikes, that Paramount <laughs> uh, reconsidered because the studio was facing a possible shortage of new productions for 19. 89 releases uh stephen king's script for <clears throat> was finished and uh ready to go so doran was given the green light to obtain the rights for paramount to start production now what is the film gosh 1989 right mm -hmm. it was released in 1989 that cemetery 
Ding, 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 ding. All right. I was about to say, I, Laz, that's all you. Yeah. That's all you. <laughs> Sweet. This is good. Everybody's getting everybody, yeah. this is good. Okay. <laughs> this actor changed her name after reading F. Scott Fitzgerald's novel, The Great Gatsby. Ooh. I want to ask for details because I'm so curious now. Same. Um, oh, muffins and cakes. Oh, she's acted oh. in a oh, bunch wait. of movies that we've dis- we haven't discussed on the pod, but we've discussed individually that we enjoy. Wait, I, I see that you know it. I saw- I heard you. Who? Me? Yes. <laughs> um, Daisy Ridley. Wasn't she the one in Star, Girl, Wars. Star Wars? No. Yeah. Yeah. But I'll- I kind of want to know that story too. <laughs> It's not right. Oh, is it? I'm trying to think of actresses named Daisy. Oh, I could. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Who else is named Daisy? Is it even Daisy? I don't know. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> you guys give up? Yeah. Okay. Oh. The answer? Yeah. Sigourney Weaver. <gasps> Interesting. Uh, All right. I mean, I'm just going to remember that because I love stuff like that so much. <laughs> I, f- awesome. I found it on like uh, her IMDb page. You just click trivia, and that was one yeah. of the trivia things. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I'll throw <laughs> it in. I might combat that one because I know a lot about Sigourney Weaver, and I think I've heard a different story of the origin of her name. Ooh. Okay. okay. Listeners, right. I will follow up on this. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay. Laws is on the case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was kind of a, that was a, a, a Laz question, too. So I, I'm not surprised he's a little miffed. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um all right for the scene with the bathtub falling two floors down after being filled with water tom hanks does an obnoxious laugh which sounds like the imitation of a sea lion this clip of him laughing is commonly used for the universal backlot tour when the tour guides joke with the visitors what's the film i know go for it is it the burbs or the money pit. Oh, uh, see, I was thinking the burbs also, but the money pit. Yeah, that makes money sense. pit. Oh, <laughs> Mel, Mel is on a roll. Jeez, all right. Mel is kicking our asses. Kind of, yeah. All right. Question six: The dream sequence where Wake stands naked, beaming light from his eyes into Winslow, is a reference to the painting Hypnosis by German artist. Sasha Schneider from 1904. What is the film? No, I don't know. <laughs> Listeners, if you know, just shout it out loud. It dream sequence where Wake stands naked, beaming light from his oh, eyes into it, Winslow. Um, the one with Harrison Ford from 1980 that they just did the sequel for. No, what is that movie? Why? Why can't I think of it? I don't know. Oh, you're talking Blade Runner. Yes, Blade Runner. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, gotta make that. See, don't, we don't have a budget for sound effects. Anyway. Uh, next season. This is all coming next season. Next season. <laughs> uh, the film is The Lighthouse. Mm. Oh, oh, I have right. not seen that yet. Oh, my God. It's so good. I love it. It is really good. That's what I've heard, yeah. <sighs> it's so That's creepy. It's a dark cause... movie. It mm. is. Oh, when he's going to town with his lady friend, the uh, yeah, the mermaid, but she's the a side, yes, a weird mermaid, a really yes. weird mermaid. It is a weird but good movie, and a Robert Pattinson. Come on, yeah. Spoiler <laughs> alert: mermaid creepy sex. Yay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's not a thing. Then, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, all right. Moving moving forward, he was so insulted when Sony offered him the role of poop in the Emoji Movie. That this inspired him to retire completely from acting and focus on being a screenwriter and a film director. Who oh is my he? God, I don't know. I mean, I know who took the part, and we all love him and know him. But yeah, oh, that's what it, that's that's what I thought the question was. That's what I thought it was too. Who? Who? I mean, why would you? I mean, on one hand, being insulted by being offered the role of poop, I get it, but <laughs> at the same time. Like I said, each one of the questions was really catered to each one of you guys. Each one so, of us. Mm, anyway. I mean, but I mean, but I'm thinking of the person that actually played the role of poop. 
Yeah. Yeah, no, that's the person know. that was offered it that no longer acts. It's somebody that used to have is it you know, all right, I hinted used to have a show that was very popular. I know now directs Jordan Peele. Oh, are you serious? Wait, <laughs> what? okay. Mel is, is I need Mel is I need just that. killing everybody. Listeners. Mel is slaying yeah. Mel and how appropriate. Yes. I need the tea though. Mel, do you know the tea on that situation? What I happened? I, we're huge Keen Peel people in this family. Huge. We watch it all the time. Yes. So I just remember talking about that at some point when we were watching it. And I don't know the backstory. But even if it's not true, that is a good story to tell why you got into directing. It's, <laughs> it's, I'm thinking, yeah. maybe, I mean, because he's, he's talented and he's so gi- he's gifted at both. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, oh he's very gift. He can he's very versatile. Both. He really is so verse. Yes. Um, I will look into this though because, like, yeah. it's weird. He comes from like a specifically com- comedy background, so why right. would you get insulted by playing the part of Pooh? Maybe it just hit. Maybe they just had a baby and he was like covered in poop or something. I don't know. It. We all have our triggers, and we all have. And right. could Pooh could have been uh, the thing. I don't want to kink shame, but yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you. I, I mean, needed at least once. Not everyone likes poo. Some people like poo. And if you like poo, I'm not even trying to be funny. You right? do you. <laughs> exactly. You do you if you like poo. <laughs> That's all I'm That'll be the to tag say. for this episode. That, uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Moving forward. Uh, America Ferrera's husband in the film is played by her actual husband in real life, mm-hmm. Ryan Pierce Williams. Now, what's the film? I know. Is it, it Barbie? Man. Yeah, it's Barbie. <laughs> I put in a Barbie question for Laz, actually. And oh, sorry, Laz. Why for I me? I thought you you saw it and I thought you loved it. I did not love Barbie. I I thought it was good, but that's okay. for, that's a conversation for a different time. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> All right. I love you. Not Laz. saying it's bad, so nobody. Oh, me. Mel's <laughs> get, she's scooping <laughs> up all the points. <laughs> all right. Uh, I don't know my social security number, but I know. All of <laughs> <laughs> OK, his Oscar win for the drama film Moonlight in 2016 marked the first time a Muslim actor has won an Academy Award. Now, who's the actor? Oh, balls, muffins. I, oh, I know muffins it. and cakes. Let somebody else answer. I do know it, though. <laughs> L- listen, <laughs> if you know, I can see his face. I can. Mahershala Ali. Or Mahershala. I don't know which Mahershala. way Mahershala. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. This, right. is, this, this is, is fascinating. Is. I just want to see Mel keep answering questions. Yeah. This is I mean, look. <laughs> Feeling the show. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> keep doing it. Keep doing it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed. I wasn't impressed with you before, Mel, but now I'm really, really impressed. Okay. Oh, that's um, nice. Thing. All right. Question number 10. Oh, my gosh. At around... Sh- Shorty knows the answer. I <laughs> know. <laughs> if this person doesn't get this one, I don't know. I'm gonna ha- I'm gonna hit my head against the wall. Anyway, at around the 52 minutes when Henry Winkler opens the closet, his black leather Fonzie jacket from Happy Days is hanging in it. What was the film? Got it. Scream. Scream. <laughs> Last Laz, Laz it, said so. got it first. Yeah. Right. Laz gets the point. All right. Thank thank goodness. All right. Other I fun fact, unless, oh. unless <laughs> it's like another uh, bonus point one, but fun fact, in addition, Henry Winkler goes out into the hallway, sees a janitor who's dressed like Freddy Krueger, also Played Freddy, by. and that janitor is played by Wes Craven, the director of the film. I love that. Oh nice. Love it. I've 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 never seen Scream all the way through. Oh, I've only I've seen never... wait, the first wait in minutes of the film. Wait a minute. When Drew Barrymore gets killed, and then I was like, ah. And I just <laughs> don't, I I, I wait. Watch the rest of it. You've never seen Scream all the way through. Mm-hmm. Like I should. <laughs> I'm open. I'll check it out. I'm cool. Oh. I just haven't up until this point. All right. <laughs> Moving forward. All right. We have a lightning round. This is most 
worth double the points, as I said. So you have an opportunity to get two points here, uh, which could really change the dynamic of the game. <laughs> uh, for better or worse. <laughs> all right. So uh, in this, actually, this question is more for me than anybody else. So that's kind of a hint. But anyway, The Other Side of the Wind was filmed between 1970 and 1976, with the editing, sorry, continuing into the 1980s. Blank left behind nearly 100 hours of footage and a work print consisting of assemblies and how to edit the scenes. In May of 2015, directors Wes Anderson and Noah Baumbach Mm -hmm. announced that they were running a campaign to raise $2 million to complete the post-production and release the film. The film was eventually completed and released in 2018. Now, oh who God. was the director? Gee, I don't know. Big story. Big story when this came out. I mean, this is all over the news because this film this, yeah. was the longest production in history of film. How did I miss it? I remember it's been in production it. since, well, the 70s and I mean, was only yeah. completed in 2018. Uh, not that long I'll, ago. I'll take a guess. It's I'm I'm positive I'm wrong, but I'm just gonna say Cecil B. DeMille. Because why not? No, but you're not far. You really aren't. So good for you. That's actually I'm impressed. <laughs> Casey, uh I'll give you I'll, I'll give Casey specifically another hint uh that this director happened to be featured in the film you and I watched together, Ed Wood, and was played by one (gasps) actor and voiced by another actor. Oh, yeah. That's a good hint. Bella Um, Lugosi? No, that was... That was the actor. Yeah. um, I will give one final hint. It's not the director of Citizen Kane, is it? Like Orson Welles? You got it! Okay. Ding, 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 ding. ding. (laughs) I was going to say this director is also featured in almost every one of our podcasts. Actually, he's featured in all of them because it's his voice saying action and cut. Oh, oh yep. Oh, interesting. Wait, wait and, and the film is, again... Uh, the film is called The Other Side of the Wind. The uh, of it's. The wind. I think it's on Netflix because I think Netflix ended up fronting a whole bunch of cash to get it made. I'm and, so curious. Uh, it, made a, it made oh, a lot of news. I gotta look it up. Crazy because I, I consume so much entertainment news and I haven't heard about this. Yeah. Me so either. I like now I'm super curious. I I'm su- I'm wondering how I missed this. Now one. I yeah, did watch Netflix, it yeah. and it's very <laughs> to to quote a, a phrase here on uh Cinema Z, uh self masturbatory. Uh <laughs> masturbatory, yeah. Masturbatory. Yeah. <laughs> it's very long in the tooth like it was uh essentially orson welles just being like i rule cinema i can do anything it's very weird and it's very long and i don't necessarily recommend it as something but i think i think people should watch it i think people should watch it just as an exploration into orson welles maybe in his directing style also to see the end of his career because this is the last thing he ever did Mm. um so in that it's sort of educational i think you should watch yeah. it for that i'm kind of curious but though. i Me fell too. asleep I... every time i've tried to watch it every oh. time and i tried watching it three or four times and i fell asleep every time oh, no. oh my gosh and you're so... still learning <laughs> yeah but i do love orson wells and what he did for cinema uh i just think that film was really weird a ham sandwich <laughs> i watched a doc documentary on him recently and they talked a lot about it and i'm mad that i didn't know dang it yeah well if you ever want to fall asleep listeners and you can't (laughs) put on the other side of the wind i think it's on netflix uh you'll be out like that anyway (laughs) listeners you've heard it here mark listens to the other side of the wind as ambient noise (laughs) (laughs) that is what he's trying to say (laughs) oh my lord that tracks (laughs) What shows are on BQN, you ask? Well, here's a rundown of some podcasts you might be interested in. All Good Things, a Star Trek Universe podcast covering all of Trek, hosted by Amy, Mark, Christos, and Kelvin. Bargain Bin Gamer, a YouTube show hosted by Davey, a self-proclaimed gamer who specializes in reviewing and showcasing affordable video games. 
If you're lost in the Delta Quadrant, check out The Captain's Couch, a Star Trek Voyager podcast hosted by Jeremiah sitting on Janeway's ready room couch. Cinema Z, a film discussion and review podcast showcasing films you probably missed but should definitely check out. Hosted by Mark, Matt, and Laz. Beam aboard the Galaxy Class, a Star Trek Next Generation podcast covering all of TNG. Hosted by Amy, Joe, Rhea, and Kevin. History with the Zilagis, a snippet of historical events from around the world. Hosted by Chrissy and Jason. For the newest Trek coverage, check out Infinite Diversity. Hosted by Chrissy and Thad. Test your Trek knowledge with Trexperts Quiz, a Star Trek quiz show hosted and written by Davey. Union Federation, covering all things Star Trek and the Orville, which we all know is really a Star Trek show. Hosted by Kyle, Kevin, Amy, and Haley. Spill the tea with What's the Tea, Bev? A Trek current events and fan interview show hosted by Christos. And for our Patreon members, we have The Hive Mind, BQN's monthly roundtable discussion with hosts and listeners. It's Green, a cornucopia of topics hosted by Mark. And Amy's Math Moments, a quick look at math moments in Star Trek, hosted by Amy. We know you have a choice of podcasts to choose from, and we thank you for listening to BQN. Assimilate the audio. Okay. Laz, uh, do you want to tell us what we're talking about next week? Sure thing. So next week, we will be discussing 2018's Annihilation, directed <laughs> by Alex Garland, starring Natalie Portman, Jennifer Jason Lee, and Tessa Thompson. In this film, a biologist's husband disappears. She puts her name forward for an expedition into an environmental disaster zone but does not find what she's expecting. The expedition team is made up of the biologist, an anthropologist, a psychologist, a surveyor, and a linguist. All women. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. I, I gotta Absolutely ask. Right. Yeah. I gotta ask, because it's me. Are any of y'all reading the book, or have you read the book before you see I the movie? I didn't even know it was a book. See? Okay. I didn't know it was a book. So for anyone out there who is curious, this is based on a book. And our one of our co-hosts, Shalimar, will be returning to the podcast for this episode. She has read the book and will be comparing throughout the episode. Mm. I look forward to hearing that. Me yes. too. I, I, I just recently read the book and um, it's a very good book. And I, I like I like the movie, too. So, yeah, look forward to that. Well, I forgot to mention, but um, it looks like Melissa Larson uh, won our trivia. I mean, of course. Like, well, I mean, I, yeah. Like, did you really have to announce that? <laughs> I, get, uh, I realized that after I did. Round of roses. <laughs> I didn't specifically count the points. I'm kind of guessing here, but <laughs> it seemed likely. Mel, you get all the flowers. Thank you. Well, we would love to hear what you thought of today's episode, and hope you'll join the Facebook group, the BQN Collective, to continue our discussion there. You can also send your thoughts to at Cinemazy Pod on Twitter, Blue Sky, and let us know if you'd like to recommend a film. Please follow the network on Twitter, Blue Sky, and Instagram at BQN Podcasts. So, Matt, where can people find you when you are not sitting with your dad watching a new film? Oh, man. Oh, that's so sweet. Uh, you can find me on uh, pretty much Instagram on at 1701BLERD. Uh, it's uh, it's my Instagram page about my web series about a gay black nerd that uses Star Trek to cope with life. Stay tuned for oh. episode three coming out soon. I'm still editing, but it's coming out soon. Uh, that's where you can find me. And Laz, where can people find you when you are not drowning in a giant river of blood that is just flushed out of an elevator <laughs> you know it's funny that happens almost daily but you know you sometimes you got to be careful 
we're not here at king shame or, or, or just no. to dive right in right uh yeah. so where people can find me you can find me on instagram threads and blue sky through my handle at las marquez l-a-z m-a-r-q-u-e-z in addition you can find my work at www.lasmarquez.com where you can see my entertainment and uh, agency advertising work. And Melissa, where can people find you when you aren't falling asleep to the ambient noises of <laughs> Requiem for a Dream? Oh. <laughs> um, I am on Twitter. I refuse to say the other name at Mel underscore Med underscore Larson or at a trivia night near you. Casey, when you're not hanging out with Andy Warhol, where can we find you? <laughs> Probably not hanging hanging out with Andy Warhol. But <laughs> oh, Casey! Oh, thanks for coming over. That was great. <laughs> oh well, yes. When I'm not uh, with Andy Warhol, you can find me uh, actually on Letterboxd and uh, Goodreads at Knitting Trekkie. Um, I track all my movies and all the books I read on both of those. I can. I, I'm also on Instagram and the platform formerly known as Twitter, also at Knitting Trekkie, but I'm a lurker. Uh, I also lurk in the BQ and Collective on Facebook. Oh, and you, I almost forgot. You can uh, find me over on another network doing a show called Literary Treks, where uh, we talk about the books and comics of Star Trek. So that's a fun one. And Mark, when you are not falling asleep to the noise of the other side of the wind which i guess is that the lee side or the anyway where can people find you it's the sleepy side of the wind it's the sleepy <laughs> side of the wind oh my i might put that on tonight i've been having a hard time sleeping so that <laughs> that sounds i need to rewatch the listeners <laughs> uh well when i'm not doing that or someone else's voice is very soothing people okay give me a break it's very mm -hmm. soothing Great. um <laughs> you can find me in the bqn collective facebook group uh, you can find me on my show, All Good Things. This is a Star Trek Universe podcast. We jump all around the whole Star Trek universe. And you can find me on Blue Sky at MW207. Please hit the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And leave us a star rating and written review that helps others to find the show. You can also follow the entire network's podcast with our master feed by searching BQN. At this time, we would like to thank our associate producer, Amy Nelson, Mother Amy. A special thanks to Laz Marquez for our artwork each and every week. The opening and closing music for this podcast is titled Dancing Dead and was provided by Ketza from the Free Music Archive, pro providing royalty-free music for content creators. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. We will add you to the Hive Mind Facebook group so you can enjoy its screen, Amy's math moments, and other network perks. With a monthly subscription of $5 or more, you can join our meetings on the Hive Mind Roundtable discussion on the second Saturday of each month. Visit patreon.com slash bqn to get all the details and watch your messages. Thank you for listening. We hope you'll tune in next time. Adios, muchachos. Bye, guys. Hello, Clary. Ha, 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 ha. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> what is their slogan? <laughs> oh, I don't... Well, do, they, do they have one? They keep changing it. It used to be like, do the right one, baby. Or that was that Diet Coke or what, when Stevie Wonder. <laughs> no, do the right one, baby. I like or, it. Or, or Ray Charles <laughs> was the. <laughs> I don't know. Didn't Britney Spears do something with them a while yeah. back? Pepsi back Pepsi. in the day. I, I did Pepsi. <laughs> Pepsi is Pepsi. It's a famous clip of Britney. Regionally, yeah. too, people refer to any carbonated beverage as Pepsi. Depending really? on some places in the United States are like, oh, I'll have a Pepsi. And it's like some sort of carbonated beverage. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs>